All right, so we're going to shift gears a little bit today. We've been doing lots of different tests for deciding if series um, converge and diverge. And we are going to continue talking about series today, um, but specifically we're going to talk about um, a type of series called Taylor polynomials. Um, and we will, we will move this into Taylor series, which are infinite series later. So these Taylor polynomials are actually like their finite series. Uh, a finite series is what we're going to be looking at. <coughs> so to start with, All right, so a compelling reason for considering series is that they are an essential means for exploring and computing <clears throat> transcendental and trig functions. Um, so let me pause uh, at that point and see if you remember transcendental. What kind of functions are transcendental? Does that phrase ring a bell at all? I don't remember what it means. That's okay. So um, transcendental functions are the ones, there's, there's several, but I'll give you some examples of familiar ones. Um, y equal e to the x is transcendental. Um, y equal the natural log of x is transcendental. Y equal um, just a general any value to the x, right, a to the x is transcendental. Um, <clears throat> you can kind of think of them as being, especially if you took Calc 1 and Calc 2 here, we do our non-transcendental functions in Calc 1, all the polynomials and rational functions and radicals and trig, and then in Calc 2 you had a few new rules about uh, derivatives that you had to learn and antiderivatives, and those were the transcendental ones, and they were these type, okay? So variations on e to the x, natural log of x, and then a to the x, where a is any um, is, a, is another rational number. Um, so let me show you how we're going to, well, but let me tell you sort of the idea. The idea is that we are going to take one of these transcendental functions, and transcendental functions are uniquely different, and trig functions too, um, than say polynomials, um, where polynomials, if you take a derivative enough times, they become zero, right? That's sort of this nice feature about polynomials that does not work for transcendental functions. If you have e to the x and you take its derivative, it is always e to the x. Or e to the anything else x has some variation of that. Every time you take the derivative, it never becomes zero. So when we're working with our, trig, or our um, Taylor polynomials here in a moment, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be creating a polynomial expression that at least nearby whatever point we care about is very, very similar to the transcendental function that we are working with because it's easier to work with um, finding those trig values or those function values with a polynomial than with a transcendental function. So some definitions first. Um, I'll just put it here for the moment. Uh, if a function... has n derivatives at C, then the polynomial P sub n of C no, p sub n of x, I said it right the first time, p sub n of x is equal to f of c plus f prime at c times x minus c plus 
f double prime at c over 2 factorial times x minus c squared. And we continue this process until we take the nth derivative, so fn. That wasn't one to do. Try that again. fn evaluated at c over n factorial times x minus c to the power n. So this is done a finite number of times. Um, as we're doing these um, today, they will tell you what n is. This isn't an infinite process. We will change this into an infinite process in another section. But for now, this is a finite value that we're looking for. This creature, this piece of n that we just created, has a name. <coughs> this is called the nth Taylor <coughs> polynomial. Nth Taylor polynomial. Um, specifically, 4f at c. So, there's a special case, however, when c is zero. Um, so just like when we isolate one component of something and it becomes really nice, a lot of times we, we do that. So um, for example, a place where you see it in Calc 1 is Raleigh's theorem. And um, the, oh, I can't remember. I'm thinking it's the mean value theorem. That's what's ringing a bell to me. So the mean value theorem, when you isolate a very specific case of it, becomes Raleigh's theorem. And it has to do with whether or not something has a, a peak between two points of a, um, uh, on a curve. So if we isolate this, so this is sort of like definition number one, then definition number two isolates this in the case where c is equal to one. So in the case – I didn't mean c is equal to one. c is equal to zero is what I'm going to say. c is equal to zero. <clears throat> we have – Everything that I already wrote before, but instead of being evaluated at c, it's going to be evaluated at 0. So instead of f of c, we have f of 0. And instead of f prime of c, we have f prime of 0. Whoops. Jumping the gun. Times x minus, well, times x minus 0, which is x. And then we have f double prime of 0. Again, divided by 2 factorial, that part doesn't change, and x minus 0 squared would be x squared. And then we would continue the process until we have the nth derivative evaluated at 0 over n factorial times x to the n. So things collapse. And it has a special name because we have this special consideration. So this is called... the nth Maclaurin polynomial. So the nth Maclaurin polynomial is an nth Taylor polynomial, but just for the special case when c is equal to 0. So this is the nth Maclaurin polynomial for f. Okay, you ready to try some? Process is not hard. Aaron says no, he's not ready to try some. We're going to help him out. All right. <clears throat> Does everybody have all that written down? No. Not yet? Okay, I'll slow down. Yeah. Thanks, Ashton. You should be ready. Right? Yep. Ready? Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with the Maclaurin case because it's just a little easier to compute. So we're going to find the nth Maclaurin 
polynomial four, and the one we're going to do it for in this case, the first one anyway, is going to be f of x equals the cosine of 2x. They'll give you the function. They will also tell you what nth polynomial finding, so they're going to tell us n equal to 4 in this case. So this is how the problem will always start out. You've got a function, and you've tell, it's telling you how far to go. So if you take a look back at the Maclaurin polynomial definition over here, this tells us that we need to go out to f fourth derivative, because n is 4. So we're going to take the original function, the first derivative, the second derivative, the third derivative, the fourth derivative. Okay? So the first function, I'm just going to rewrite it because we're going to evaluate them here in a minute anyway. So our first, our first original function is cosine 2x. What is the derivative of the cosine of 2x? Okay, so it'll have a 2. Negative and it'll have a negative, right? So the derivative of the cosine is negative sine of x. Because I have 2x, I will have a times 2 on the outside. Is that okay? Which reminds me, I still have not seen almost any of you in my office to do gateways. But I'm sure you're all coming very, very soon, right? Of course. Okay, good. All right, second derivative. So now we need the derivative of negative 2 sine 2x. What will it be? Yep, negative 4 cosine 2x. We're going to do this three, uh, four times total, so they're on the third one, the third derivative. So the third derivative, and you can write it with the three little you know, hash marks like that, or you can write a 3 up there at this point. It doesn't matter. Um, what is the derivative of negative 4 cosine 2x? Yep, 8 sine 2x. Trig functions are nice because they have this oscillating behavior. Um, the fourth one, which I'll put a 4 at this point instead of 4 hash marks. What is the derivative of 8 sine 2x? 16. Is it positive or negative? Positive. Yeah, derivative of sine is cosine. So 16 cosine 2x. Okay, everybody good with that? Yeah, sines and cosines and, and then the powers of 2 that show up in this. Okay, we're going to evaluate this because it says Maclaurin, right? So since it says Maclaurin, we're going to evaluate this at c equal to 0. So I need to evaluate all five of these, the original one plus the four derivatives, at c equal to 0. So I need to find f of 0. I need to find f prime of 0. I will do f double prime of 0, triple prime at 0 and the fourth derivative at zero. All right, so what happens when I put zero into cosine? So maybe I should just make mention real quick that the two in the inside now doesn't matter, right? Because I'm putting zero in. So what is the cosine of zero? The cosine of zero is one, so the first one is simply just one. What happens when I have sine of zero? The sine of zero is zero. So I have a sine zero showing up on the first one, the first derivative one, and on the third derivative one. So I can put zeros on those automatically. It doesn't matter what the coefficient is. They're zeros. All right, on my second derivative, the cosine of zero shows up again, which we said is one, and then it gets multiplied by negative four. So it's actually negative four, right? How about the last one? What's the fourth derivative at 0 of 16 cosine 2x? That would be 16. Okay, so far so good? All right, so we are creating p sub 4 because my n is equal to 4 here. And I'll write it out with the zeros in it initially just so you can see them there, and then we'll collapse it to how it sort of would reduce if you didn't want to write the zeros in. So the first piece is simply f of 0. That we said is 1. And then we have plus f prime, which was 0 times x to the power 1, so 0x. And then we have plus um, the, well, I'll write it that way, the second derivative, which was 4, divided by 2 factorial times x squared. And then I have 0x cubed. 
I guess if we really want to be clear, we would be writing 0 over 3 factorial, just so you can see that they're there. So we'll do that. And then I have 16 over 4 factorial x to the 4th. Those are all the pieces, but clearly some of them are zeros. So we're going to clean it up a little bit, but not as much as you might have expected. So piece of 4 of x is going to be the 1. And we're going to leave the factorials as they are. And I'll tell you why in just a second. But this is 4 over 2 factorial, x squared. Uh, and it was, wait, it was negative 4. I left that out. So right here, I want this to, oh, good grief, select it. Negative. And then positive 16 over 4 factorial, x to the 4th. Okay, this is where we are going to stop in terms of simplifying, if you will. Uh, and the reason is because if you take a look at it in this version, what you can actually see is some patterns starting to form over what's happening. And that's actually where we're going to be heading when we get to the Taylor series, is looking to see if we can condense this into a pattern, because eventually we're going to have a plus dot, 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 because it's going to be infinite at the end. We don't have that right now. But you can take a look. First, you can look at the signs. What's happening in my signs? It's it is an alternating series, you bet. What's happening to my numerators? Yeah, they seem to be powers of two, right? Or something like that, right? We've got some sort of... They're even. They're also even, yes. What about the denominators? Four. They seem to be doubling, right? So if you had to expect what your next term would be in this sequence, what would you think that the next term would be after this? Would it be positive or negative? Negative. It would be negative. It would be negative 64. It'll be 64, not 32. Yeah. Over 6 factorial x to the 6. Yeah, this would actually be our next term in this sequence. So noticing these patterns is going to become more important later. Yeah, you know? Are you looking at my 16 on top? This piece? No. no, no. Oh. It's, it's negative 64 over 8. Oh, I just wrote it wrong. Yes, thank you for fixing that. It should be 6. Jumping the gun on that. Yep, it's 6 factorial. Yeah, so we've got even factorial showing up on bottom, and we've got powers of 4 showing up on top is what we really have. Right, the first one here is 4 to the 0. This is 4 to the 1. This is 4 squared. This is 4 cubed. Do you see that? Okay, so we don't really want to, like, clean up our factorials on the bottom because then I lose the ability to see the pattern. I don't want to lose the ability to see the pattern. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, we're going to try another one that's not a trig function, so it's not uh, going to have that same you know, cyclic pattern, at least not in the same way. Um, so same directions. We're finding a Maclaurin series. We're going to do our function is e to the negative x um, and we're going to do this at n equal to 5. So again, <clears throat> I'm just going to rewrite this so that I can have it in a kind of table view. Uh, so this is f of x equals e to the negative x. What is the derivative of e to the negative x? Negative e to the negative x. What is the second derivative of negative e to the negative x? e to the negative x. How about my third derivative? Negative e to the negative. Yep. How far are we going? Five of them. So fourth is next, and then I'll need my fifth. What's the fourth one? E to the negative x. Mm -hmm. e to the negative x. <laughs> yeah. And the fifth one? Okay, so it doesn't necessarily have the same cyclic pattern as the other one because it's not trig, but this one did create a cyclic pattern itself too, right? Um, and if I had a coefficient up there and it wasn't a negative x, obviously the pattern created would look different. Um, but generally speaking, it, it's pretty simple and straightforward to find derivatives of powers of e. And we're evaluating this at 0. So f of 0, f 
prime of zero all the way down to the fifth derivative at zero. Okay, powers of zero, that's fabulous, right? Uh, so again, the exponent being negative actually doesn't matter, kind of like the, the interior of the cosine over here having a two in it didn't matter because I'm evaluating it at zero. So what is e to the zero? One. What is negative e to the zero? Negative one. And then it just repeats, right? I have one, and I have negative one, and I have one, and I have negative one. And it would keep going indefinitely. So we're doing p sub 5 because they told us n equal to 5. And the first piece is simply the first value, 1. And then I have the derivative, which is negative 1. Oh, we'll write it like this for the moment, times x. Plus we have 1 over 2 factorial times x squared plus negative 1 over 3 factorial x cubed <coughs> sorry uh, then I have positive 1 over what is that 3? 4 so 4 factorial x to the 4th and then negative 1 over 5 factorial x to the fifth. I've, I've chose to put my negatives on the top instead of put minuses between, but if you want to put the minuses between instead of the pluses where those negative values are, that's totally fine. So this would work, or you could have something that looked like this. Okay, so again, this happens to be an alternating series, right? I promise they're not all alternating series, but this one is. You can definitely see a pattern, yeah? Numerators are all one, except for the pluses or minuses of negatives, right? So, um, and, and in both cases, if we were doing an alternating series, whether it's this one or it's this one, we'd have that negative one to a power, either negative one to the n or negative one to the n plus one, just to make it start or stop at the right negative location. Um, and then my denominator is just increasing factorials along the way, right? All good? Okay, we're going to do a McLaurin, this is McLaurin, we're going to do a Taylor polynomial next. They're not any different, they just end up looking a little bit messier in terms of operation, how we do them. They just end up looking a little messier at the end. So we're going to find the nth Taylor polynomial at C. And our function is one over x squared. And we're gonna do n equal to four. And now they actually have to tell us what C is and it's going to say C equal to two. All right, I need a bunch of derivatives, but it would probably be helpful if I would rewrite x, the one over x squared first. So how could I rewrite that to be more helpful? X to the negative two. Yeah, x to the negative two. So that's what we're gonna be working with when we take our derivatives. So f of x is x to the negative two. What is the derivative of x to the negative two? Negative two x to what power? Yeah, decrease one, so negative three. What is the second derivative? Six x to the negative four, good job. The third derivative? Negative 24 x to the negative fifth. It's a very good looking five, that's better. And then the last one, because I have n equal to four, Yeah, it's 120 
and x to the negative sixth. Is that all right? All right, but we're not evaluating these at zero now. We're evaluating them at two. Uh, if we were evaluating them, well, here it wouldn't work at all because I get zeros in the denominator, but typically speaking, I'm able to evaluate things at zero and it's just simply easier to do. But on this one, we're asked to do it centered at two. So f of two, f prime of two, um, f double prime, triple prime, and the fourth prime. Okay, so what do I get if I put the number two into x to the negative two? Yeah, it's actually one fourth. Um, if you'd like to use your calculator to calculate these so that you're not doing it by hand, that's perfectly acceptable. Um, we're going to evaluate two for negative two x to the one, negative third, not one third, negative third. Does anybody have a value? Yeah, it's negative one fourth. How about six x to the negative four? Uh huh, three eighths is right. Negative 24x to the negative fifth. Three fourths. Three fourths, yeah, very close. So negative three fourths is right. And our last one. One twenty x to the negative six. Fifteen eighths it is. All right, so here are our five values that we need for our fourth Taylor polynomial. Um, putting them together is a little longer because we don't just get to put in x, x squared, x cubed. We have to do x minus 2 each time. So the first value is 1 fourth. Um, the sex va second value is negative, and it's negative 1 fourth, and then times what would have been x is now x minus 2. It's always x minus c. And then I have positive, and it is 3 eighths, but it's 3 eighths over 2 factorial. So I'm going to condense that by doing the 3 eighths times the 2 factorial on the bottom instead of doing division by fractions, because that will be equivalent. And then this will be x minus 2 squared. Uh, the next one is negative 3 fourths, so it's 4 times 3 factorial. And it's x minus 2 cubed. And then I have positive 15 eighths, so 15 over 8, and then times my 4 factorial. And it's x minus 2 to the fourth. The processing is not any different. Um, the numbers just end up being a little more complicated and a little less easy to determine exactly what's happening in terms of what patterns do I see here, right? This is not quite as straightforward. In fact, it's not very straightforward at all, except for the factorial part that is clearly just doing what the other ones did. Okay, any questions? Okay, so I alluded to this at the beginning, or at least I talked about it verbally. And so we're going to write it down and show some graphs so you can see what's happening visually. So we can approximate the value of a transcendental function using its Maclaurin or Taylor series expansion. So we're going to consider example number one. Uh, 
Uh, example number one was f of x equals cosine 2x, right? And we're going to graph the f of x, right, cosine 2x, and the p4 that we found. And I care about it being nearby zero. So we're going to put centered at x equals zero, because that's McLaurin, right? We were looking at the x equals zero location or c equals zero location. So I want you to grab your calculator. If you don't have one with you, I might have an extra one actually. Let me see. Okay. Does anybody not have a calculator? Everybody has one with them today? Excellent. So what you're going to do is you're going to put um, the first equation, um, y1, as the sine, sorry, the cosine of 2x. And in y2, you're going to put the piece of 4 that we found over here. Oops, I don't think I got it all. in y2. Uh, if you don't know where factorial notation is, let me know. I can show you where it is in your calculator, or you can just multiply it out and put it in there yourself um, as the value it, it's going to equal. That's fine, too. So uh, it doesn't need this part of it, obviously, but the rest of it will be there. So cosine 2x and 1 minus Um, and because it's a trig function, honestly, if you just look at the graph from like about negative pi to pi, it'll be sufficient. It'll kind of tighten it in and it'll make it look a little bit better. So if you do from negative pi to pi for your x values, for your window, and then because this is cosine, so it's bouncing up and down between negative one and one, maybe go from negative two to two on your y values. And I'm going to sketch what my graph is showing, and we'll make sure everybody else is, has that same look to it, or we'll see where we're off. So for the cosine value, that's not it. So this is the cosine graph, roughly speaking. And your P sub 4 graph looks something like this. y2, this is y1. Okay, does anybody's graphs not resemble something like that? Radians, make sure you're in radians. Uh, if you've got an issue, that would be a first thing to check. Okay, is your not? That's a minus sign. You have to use a negative sign, which is the bottom. Yeah, this calculator is for second. Uh, second. Uh -huh, there you go. Yep. And then I suggested your one and one not so just be two and negative two. It'll make it a tighter kind of look. Negative two two. Okay. Anybody else's graph? Okay, so what I would like to focus on is the values that are nearby x equals zero, which would be right in here. And as you take a look at that graph, it's really close, isn't it? Right? If, if that's all the graph you looked in, like if you zoomed in on this piece, 
you might mistake and not even know which one's which. They're so similar around the point x equals zero. That's our goal. Now, we actually talked about what p sub 6 should look like. And so just for fun, we're going to do this real quick. If we did p sub 6, it would already look like what p sub 4 was, but it would have one additional term. Oops, that's not what I meant to do. So this was p sub 4. And then p sub 6 we talked about being minus 64 over 6 factorial x to the 6th. So write in your calculator right now, just turn off y2, which just the way you turn it off is by high, going to the equals part and pressing enter. It'll unhighlight it. And then you can write the same thing down that you already had plus this additional term of 64, negative 64 over 6 factorial x to the 6th. And I will just graph it on my screen in a different color so that I don't erase it. But the graph ends up looking like something like that. Does yours look like that too? So it actually looks even closer to the graph we already have further out than the one we already started with. It's hugging the curve even more closely. And if we went out to p to the eight, p sub eight, we would actually flip it back up, so it would, the flip would go back up, up instead of down, right? It would look like an extended w or whatever. We would continue this graph of it. And again, it would get closer and closer the further and further we go out to being the approximation of the polynomial further out than simply at x equals zero, okay? So this is what we're actually doing. And the longer, I'll say it that way, the longer the polynomial, the closer the polynomial mirrors the function. And I'd like for us to actually use these graphs to approximate it so you can see from a numerical perspective, not just from a graphical perspective, that this works. So considering these polynomials, let me change my direction so you can see what they look like that I'm talking about. We're going to approximate the function using the polynomial found before. Um, the questions that you have specifically like this tell you which it's going to go back to, and it's going to be another problem you've already done. So if it says next to it that this looks like problem number 20, it means you did problem number 20 before, and that's you've already done the polynomial part of it. So you're not redoing that part of it. You're just doing this new part. Um, so the polynomial found before. And the one we're going to do is the one we just did. So f of x equals the cosine of 2x. And we're going to approximate nearby x equals 0, but it's not going to be at x equals 0. It's going to be at x equals 1 fourth. Okay? You would probably agree that 1 fourth is not too terribly far away from x equals 0. So it's always going to be close to the value you were already doing. So this one's close to x equals 0. All right, so from the perspective of p sub 4, we can find this. So p sub 4 of 1 fourth means I will have 
one fourth plugged into the equation that currently should be still stored in your y2 <laughs> if we didn't delete it. Yeah, Hannah? How did you get one It's given in the problem. So okay. these are the direction sets for the problem. All of this is the direction sets for the problem. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that'll be given, exactly. And, but it will be close to the, Z, the value, in this case, zero, that you already created your polynomial surrounding. So that will always happen, yeah. So we're going to do P sub 4 at 1 fourth, and we're going to find our actual function value at 1 fourth, because what I want to show you is just how close those values actually are. And because they're still stored in your calculator, this is easy to do. So you should be able to go into your table and put in 1 fourth. If your table is not set up so that you're able to put a value in, let me know and we'll fix that real quick. Is your setup, Aaron? No? Okay. If you still have your y2 off, you'll need to turn y2 back on and it won't show up in your table. It should put in one fourth. They'll be able to put in one fourth into their table. Yeah? Okay, good. Okay, so when you put in one fourth, what did p sub 4, which is y2, give you? We'll go with six decimals. I'll start you out. Point 0.8, what's next? Seven seven five eight two, yeah. That one is for. Oh, I'm sorry. I, my Y three is what's turned on. I apologize. How about uh, seven seven six zero four? Does that look right? Okay. How about the actual function value? What does it equal? Five eight three, yeah. So, okay. So we didn't go very far. P sub four is not a very long polynomial when you compare it to something that would like be an infinite polynomial, right? It's pretty. I mean, four is a finite number, very finite. It's very small. And even with P sub four, we're still already correct with this to three decimal places. It is correct to the, well, and if you round one of them, it's almost to four decimal places, right? So we are correct already. So this, not correct, but this is accurate. To three decimals. And if you still have it stored in there, if you don't, it's okay. But if you actually have P sub six stored in there, and you can put that one in, that's the one I accidentally had on just a moment ago. Yeah, so it's 0.877. Five eight two. The other one was five eight three, wasn't it? Yeah, two five so five five eight three. So this one is accurate to, again with rounding to to, to six decimal places, but it's accurate to five decimals without rounding. So we should find that to be really interesting, that there's this way that we can take something that's super finite, right? I mean, like we know what finite means, but like these are really small finite numbers. And that even with these really small finite numbers, we can still get something really accurate to a transcendental function by using Taylor and or Maclaurin polynomials. All right, homework. Page 648. 17, 20, 22, 27, 30, 31, 39, 40, and 43. And just to give you a heads up, these last three are just like what I just did here. So pay attention when you're doing them. You've already got, it'll say next to it which one it's referring you back to. It'll refer you back to problem like, 22 or problem 31 or whatever, you've already created the polynomial. You don't have to recreate the polynomial. Okay? Any questions on that? All right.